So today I want to ask you to take another bold step. Your whole life is a result of risk. Some of you took risks to get an education, risks to get a job, risks to buy things, risks to sell things, risks to fall in love, risks to end a love, uh, risks to build friendships, to step out of friendships, risks perhaps to move to this region, perhaps to move to somewhere else. Your whole life is a story of risks. If you and I sat down to talk, you would share with me a story of things that you had to trust God for or things you had to step up for and you took a risk. Is this not true? You've all taken risks. And today, I want to urge you to take another risk because God has life as he's intended it to be and the only way you can enter into that is through faith. And I took a risk this last two weeks. I laid on the couch, immobilized by pain for about four or five days after October 7th, horrific attacks by Hamas against the border dwellers in Gaza. And I was horrified by what I saw, not just in the news, but through text messages from so many of my friends in Israel. It's a major part of my life. And after watching this unfold for four or five days, I felt no peace. I was literally just dancing around my house in anxiety. It was an anxiety not of fear or worry, but an anxiety of I can't be there to help and to comfort. And it was an active question because I actually had a trip booked to leave November the 1st. I had a live air ticket for LL. And I prayed together with Leslie, my wife. She said, I feel that God's called me to stay and for you to go. Perhaps we need marriage counseling. I don't know. Uh, no, she has faith that God would send me and bring me back. And so I took a risk. You gave amazing gifts. You gave like $27,000 toward the needs of Israel. And we've ministered to many different organizations and so grateful for what you've done. But because of your gifts, yeah. God loves a cheerful giver. That's why it's a good thing to clap when you give. Because of what you've done, I was able to take extra gifts. So I got a text message just before I left. And in the text message from a man named Yanon, he was commander of a regiment of soldiers. He said, I have 28 soldiers. And I said, what do they need? And he said, amongst various things, Leatherman. Do you know Leatherman, those multi-tool devices? I was staying with my son in L.A. before I took my flight to Tel Aviv. And so we went down late at night to Home Depot. We bought every box of Leathermans they had, you know, when they have up in the top stack there. And the guy who served us, as soon as they said the word Israel, he said, going to give you a discount. So he gave me a discount, which was very kind. I found a lot of goodwill on this journey. A lot of people who love Israel, and this is so important, because your Jewish friends are not okay. And they need to hear you speak out for them. So I packed up my suitcases. I had five suitcases of 210 pounds of luggage all by myself, and I got on this plane, which was pretty empty. And as I looked around the plane, I realized I was the only one not going home to Israel. Everybody else was going home got to the airport, went through immigration. Usually there's a long snaking line, takes about an hour and a half. There was no line. The lady at the window was asleep. I had to wake her up when I got there. <laughs> As I went through the airport, there was nobody. My entire trip there, I met no tourists at all. Not a single tourist. I did meet one humanitarian aid team. That was it. I was the only one. And I was able to go and visit those soldiers. On my last night there, just before I flew out, I went into the West Bank, and I was able to give out those Lebanons. <laughs> you were with me. <laughs> because these men know the word, and I was able to speak from the Hebrew scriptures. I patted the ground. I said, this is the promised land. This is where the promises come true. 
And when the story of this war is finally written, there will be an account of how the God of Israel has showed up in some surprising way. It'll be different than any other time in the past because that's the nature of God. But he will show up. He will vindicate you. He will deliver you again. And then I gave them the Leathermans. <laughs> and they, they just, they, they lined up to get them. And I wished I had more. I ran out. I just given away, given away, given away. And, but they know that we're with them that there are followers of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, who love them and believe in them. I, I can't communicate to you how important that is. The experience the Jewish people have had at the hand of Christians is extremely painful. Many of you would be aware of the Holocaust, which is a historic fact. But the Holocaust is only one episode of 2,000 years of painful experience of the Jewish people at the hand of believers in the Jewish Messiah. You and I worship the God of Israel. We have the Hebrew scriptures. We worship a Jewish savior. And at some point, you're going to have to deal with the demonic plot of anti-Semitism. Because if you don't deal with the plot of anti-Semitism, you can't deal with any racial hate that's in our world today. So today, I want to challenge you not to get on a plane to go to Israel, although maybe God will call you to do that, but rather for you to take another risk. I did what I was afraid to do, and I found the courage to do it. What has God asked you to do that you need to have the courage to do? Because there are things that God wants to do that require your faith. Now, faith is believing in God, but faith is also knowing that God believes in you. See, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him because they are confident that he hears and he responds to their prayers. Do you believe in God? Do you know that God believes in you? Because when you have that, your faith is bolstered. You see, faith is what helps a young person who's out there on the playing field, maybe playing football, go for a touchdown because dad is in the stands or jump up for a layup because dad is in the bleachers. It's what your little boy or little girl will run to when dad is clapping his hands, says, come on, come on, and they can walk and come toward you. Your father in heaven believes in you and he asks you to believe in him. This is the work of faith because he wants to give you life as he intended it to be. If God wanted you to die and go to heaven, you'd all be dead now because he would want you home with him. But you and I are still alive. So you and I are here to bring heaven to earth. That's, by the way, the reason why we do Christmas lights. I want you to imagine for a moment what would happen if we didn't do evergreen lights this year. What if we said, everybody take the Christmas off and just enjoy your families? I know you would immediately think, oh, what a good thing. But then think this, think this question through. Where else in the greater Puget Sound region is there a Christmas light show totally free that promotes Jesus, that welcomes people from all kinds of racial and ethnic backgrounds to hear the good news, that welcomes them into the building for cookies and cocoa, and they get to see a free movie and free music about Jesus who was born in the season. And then suddenly the lights mean a lot. I have faith that this Christmas will be our best ever. And we're going to start the show not with some of the lights on, but all of the lights on. Can you imagine how tragic it would be if we only lit up half of the building? That's where we're going to be if you don't show up on, tu on the, well, Tuesday. You can come Tuesday, but better if you came Saturday at 9 a.m. Now, some of you, you're newer at Evergreen. You've only joined the last year. You have no idea. You haven't seen the lights. Uh, it's the biggest church light show in the region. Half a million light bulbs on the building set to music, but it's more than just the lights. It's the whole environment around the whole campus. People come grumpy and they leave joyful. It's pre-evangelism, it's evangelism, and we all get to serve. There's nobody who gets paid to do this. Obviously, the church staff are here, but we're throwing our hearts across the line with everybody else. And night after night, there are teams of volunteers who bake cookies, who meet people, we talk to people. And all of this is set up with volunteers. We had some folks coming to buy Culture's Coffee this morning, and they said, it's amazing. You guys do all of this without paying people? I said, yep. Some of you pay people to put lights on your house. God bless you. 
But here at Evergreen, we're all here volunteering. So how about this Saturday, 9 a.m., you come help turn the lights on and get this thing ready. How about we have the greatest outpouring of volunteer energy this coming Saturday. So we... Sounds to me like we're going to have about a quarter of you. How about the rest of you who are not cla clapping? Download the Evergreen Church app and start signing up for the lights nights. You can choose the nights, how you serve. You can bake cookies, and yes, you can even eat as many cookies as you want because you won't eat that many because you'll get to a point you just had too many. Everybody at the lights. What is the thing that you're believing for? Take another risk. Well, we get this spirit of faith from the Word of God. Faith comes through hearing and that through the Word of God. We're going to be today in Psalm 121. This is a beautiful psalm. And it's a psalm that gives us hope. When we don't know where to look for help, it tells us where to look for help. Whenever you come into the building, there are always Bibles you can pick up on the rack in the back. We believe in the book. I encourage you to get a paper Bible. I love all the electronic stuff, but get yourself a paper Bible so you can become a student of the Word of God, and it becomes your own scriptures that you've marked and underlined. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. I want to ask you, what risks would you take if you had nothing to fear? The good news is you have nothing to fear. So why aren't you taking risks? Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. So many of us get stunted by anxiety. Don't let anxiety stunt you. I went to see our friends in Israel. One of them, of course, is Pastor Israel Pakhtar. You're going to see a picture here on the screen. And some of you saw the video that I sent a week or so ago. And what motivated me it was a word, a word that God put into my spirit as I laid on my couch, watching the tragic news, getting the text messages from my friends. And it was this simple phrase, to go and comfort those who grieve in Zion. In particular, there was a family in the church, pastor and his wife, whose son died in battle, and I just wanted to go and give them a hug. And it's only God would work it out. When I arrived at the church building, they arrived at the church building at the same moment. And we were the only people in the parking lot. I thought, God worked out all the timing, and I gave Chaim and his wife Miriam a hug, and many, many others. I laid in anxiety, October 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And the anxiety was this. Uh, obviously, the humanitarian tragedy was horrendous. Um, what was more painful when I was there was that what you and I see in the news is for the people who live there, personal text messages about people they know and love from family, from school, from friendship relationships. All nine million people in Israel know somebody who was killed in the massacre. Everybody is connected. And their phones are filled with pictures, not from the news, but from their friends and from their family and the text messages they had in the last hours. And as I'm taking all this in, so many things went through my mind. First, there's all the people that I know and love. And then knowing I had tickets that I had to decide what to do with. And then I thought of my family. I exist because of a Jewish man who gave his life, obviously Jesus. But I exist because I have an ancestor who rescued five Jewish families like a 
Schindler and brought them to New York. He left his 16-year-old son behind. He was taken in by a Dutch reform pastor and he went back to Spain to get more Jews and died in the Inquisition. And I lived because the 16-year-old boy was raised by believers. And my whole life is a gift. I realized that every breath I take is a gift. And as I laid in that couch, I thought, how much longer can I lay here without going to Israel, to my people, to be with them in this time of need? How can I look any Jew in the eye in the future if I don't stand with them in the most difficult time? And so I booked my ticket. And as soon as I booked my ticket, I felt peace. And I know most of you, that's when your anxiety would start. It was the opposite. That's when the peace came. And that's the nature of faith. Now, can I just say again, the point of this message is not to get you on a plane to go to Israel. My hope is that you're inspired as I follow Christ, that you'll follow Christ too and that you'll do the thing that God wants you to do that's the risk. All of you are afraid of something, and you need to make a commitment to do what you're afraid of. Like Caitlin, who got baptized, she made that decision this morning. She made the decision of baptism. Some of you need to make that choice. Another simple thing is prayer for the sick. I have this little bottle of oil. I was up on my desk. It's the oil of gladness. Anybody need gladness? Oil of gladness. It's lily of the valley. I mean, that must take it to a whole supernatural level of a spiritual authority. But the scripture says, if the elders of the church anoint you with this oil and they pray for you, that you're going to get better. And that's a risk of faith. I'm going to put that right here on the platform to remind you that we're a church that believes in praying for the sick. Some of you need to take risks in conversations this week, risks about finances, risks about conversations, all, all that kind of stuff that's involved in the life of faith. But it begins with the word and claiming the word in prayer and then stepping out on the basis of God's promises. For me, it was comfort those who grieve in Zion. So I arrived at the El Al counter. They go through an interrogation. They're really steely-faced when they interrogate you. And so I'm being asked all these security questions, and she asked a simple question, where are you going to go? I said, I'm going to Ashdod to see. And as soon as I said Ashdod, she started crying. Uh, she was a young Israeli. She was fully aware that Ashdod is one of the targeted cities by Hamas in the rocket attacks. And there was an immediate bonding. Nothing was too difficult from that point on. Uh, I went through TSA. And again, that's usually not a very emotional experience. And I showed them my ticket, and they saw Israel, and the guy just sighed, and he said, oh, God bless you. And then I got to the plane, and the pilot starts his, this is the captain speaking conversation. But he talked about this group experience. We're all in together. Another young Israeli said, we're all one on this plane. And... I began to think, what am I doing? Uh, what I'm doing is the risk of faith, stepping into the thing God asked me to do. And so I took the trip, and I'm glad I did. I got on the plane to come home. And as I got on the plane to come home, the guy next to me, uh, I said to him, where are you from? He said, I'm from Ashdod, and he had escaped from the the, the dance party at Nova, this celebration that happened in the desert. He talked, I won't tell you all the stories, but he told me his stories. And he got a job in L.A. for a few months, and he said, I just need to get out for a little while. And I said, yeah, I understand. And we cried together. We talked together throughout the flight. He pulled up his phone, and he showed me this video, and it was a road to Ashdod, Highway 4. I travel Highway 4 all the time. And he showed me this car driving down the road, and it exploded. And as a rocket hit the road, I just thought, I drive on that road. That could have been me. But there was this moment when I first arrived. They handed me this app, and they said, put this on your phone. And if the app goes off, uh, pull safely to the side of the road. You have 40 seconds in Ajdod, 15 seconds up on the northern border. I was up there with near Hezbollah. And how are you doing, by the way? You're all listening. 
<laughs> closely, yeah. So pull over to the side of the road and get down on the sidewalk, face down, put your hands on the back of your head. And I'm thinking, you know, the chances of this happen, I, I don't know, I'm kind of this guy who just kind of thinks through probabilities, and I'm thinking, this, it's not really likely it's going to happen. My, my next drive was to Ashdod, and sure enough, the siren sounded, the alarm went off on my phone, and cars were pulling off, and I pulled off, and I looked down to see where the sidewalk was, and all there was was this dirt path with the dust about this deep from so many people walking on it, and I had new clothes on. You know, you go on a trip, you buy new clothes, and I'm looking, and I've got these new clothes on, and then I looked down at the dust, and the first thought through my mind is, I am not getting down in that dust, because these are brand new clothes. <laughs> And then I'm watching people hit the ground. And I thought, I'm getting down in the dust. <laughs> and I discovered I have an amazing prayer life at that moment. It's so easy to pray. <laughs> and then I heard over my head, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And I could feel the concussion as the Iron Dome is taking rockets out over my head. And I got up off of the ground. <laughs> and my body was just covered with Israel, it was just dust. I was just covered in dust. In fact, I still have the dust on my shoes. I'm not going to wipe it off. <laughs> and I was never more proud to be dirty than that moment. <laughs> and it felt connected with the purposes of God, the promises of God, and maybe my deepest fear. What did I get out of the risk that I took? A much bigger heart. I think if anything happened in my journey, I got a much bigger heart for Israel, for God's purposes, and for God's promises. What are you going to risk doing? The opposite of fear is love. And what will happen as you and I step out in faith, our hearts are going to be filled with greater love. And the reason why so many of us are restricted in love is because we're living in fear. We've got to step out of fear and live a life of faith and begin expressing love. Yes. Yes. This Christmas, share the light. Yes. This Christmas, our opportunity more than ever you don't have to get on a plane to go to Israel. You can stand out here, put up some Christmas lights, hand out Christmas cookies, shine the light of Jesus, demonstrate the power of light over darkness. That is our response to this terror attack that's taken place, what seems so far away. I want to give to you the rewards, the rewards of people who live this life of faith and how you and I can experience those rewards. Three things. Number one, your maker is a promise keeper. Your maker not only made you, he also makes promises, promises to keep you, and he will always remember and keep all of his promises. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The problem that we as humans face is that we sinfully think that we're on our own. And when you imagine you're on your own, you either become proud or fearful. And some people respond with pride. I'm on my own, I can take care of myself, I can do it my way, and they don't want any interference from anything supernatural or divine. Now, on the other hand, is you can become really weak and fearful and avoid the things that you're supposed to do, and you run away from the very things that could help you and bless you. In the midst of this is God who says, I am your helper, I am your keeper, I am your strength, I make promises, I keep them. You know, a lot of people in the world today think they need a course in developing better self-esteem so they have more confidence, assertiveness training. You don't need any more self-confidence. You need a God consciousness an awareness of who God is. Now, this is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. But we live in a neighborhood where people have so many different definitions of the word God. Just because somebody in your neighborhood or your workplace says they believe in God doesn't mean they believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of our Lord Jesus Christ because we only understand him through the Jewish experience and through the revelation of Jesus. 
In your Bible, the word Lord is in four capital letters, L-O-R-D. And if you've got a paper Bible, circle it. Bring a pen. Don't just look at me. Become students of the word. Is your Bible your Bible? Are you reading your Bible, underlining your Bible, marking your Bible? Become a student of the Word and ask yourself questions about Scripture, like why is the word Lord over 6,000 times in the Bible capitalized? Think about that. We're going to come back to it in a moment. But I want to tell you the context of why. It starts with a lady named Moria. You're going to see her picture here on the screen. She has a headdress on. And... She is the caretaker of the biblical site Shiloh. I was able to see some cool archaeological things. I've never been to Shiloh before. I'm not sure how I missed it. See, Shiloh is the place where God's tabernacle first rested. It was chosen through Moses, Joshua, as the place where the tabernacle would be in the center of the land in biblical Samaria. And it was chosen by God for a very specific region, reason because in this little hill, it's surrounded by a circle of smaller hills that God's tabernacle would be in the center of this ring of hills. Now, this lady here, Moria, is an Orthodox Jew. Her hair is covered because no one sees her hair except her husband. She won't shake your hand when you meet her or hug you because no one touches her except her husband and her children. She is totally devoted to her husband. She had a beautiful understanding of biblical marriage. We had a great talk about that. Moria had a unique connection with biblical Shiloh because her family were the first Jews in 2,000 years to settle that piece of land with a vision that God gave them that they would lead the archaeological excavation to uncover it and to plant the fields around it. And so her father led the archaeological team. God supernaturally provided funds so that they could create these interactive uh, different um, facilities that help particularly children really grasp what's happening at this site. Really, really well done. But what touched me was the story of her dad. When he first moved there, he laid out in the middle of a field, a field that had once been a vineyard 2,000 years ago. He'd been reading the prophet Jeremiah, verse 30, chapter 31, verse 2, where the prophet said, I will again plant vineyards in Samaria. And he said, Father, according to your word, I claim this promise, but how are we going to pay for it? And so he asked God to fund the bill to plant the vineyard. Beautiful story, a lot of detail. I won't go into it, but God supernaturally gave him the funds to plant the vineyard that began everything that they were doing there. And I looked at these beautiful hillsides covered with vines that went on forever. It looked like Napa Valley all planted as a result of faith according to God's promise that after 2,000 years, the Jews would return to their land and again plant vineyards in Samaria. And as she told the story, I thought, how powerful is the word of God? <laughs> and then I said, Moria, how does it make you feel to think that two billion people around the world read the Hebrew Bible and pray to the God of Israel and follow his ways. She began crying. She said, it makes me really emotional to think, especially you Christians, how you believe the Bible and what it teaches about marriage particularly and how important marriage is to life. We had a great talk about the book of Genesis and the value of marriage. We found incredible common ground in our conversation. But what really touched me was this biblical site, Shiloh. We're at the place where Hannah prayed for Samuel. We're at the place where Samuel heard the voice in the middle of the night. They have the jars there from the days of Samuel where Samuel would have ladled out the oil to fill up the lamps. But then she explained what was happening in the entire site. So in the center is the low hill. It's surrounded by higher hills. 
on this lower hill, we know the tabernacle was there because there are post holes drilled in the ground that form a rectangle that is 50 cubits by 100 cubits, which are the dimensions of the tabernacle. You can stand on the dirt where the Holy of Holies once was. And I'm standing there thinking, Joshua was here. David was here. Saul was here. Incredible moment. And then I looked up at the hills, and I thought about Psalm 121. So it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? He's not saying my help comes from the God of the mountains. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is the pagans, they put their gods at the top of mountains, but the God of Israel is not found at the top of mountains. His house is found at the level with the people. And then she explained, when the archaeologists excavated the site around biblical Shiloh, all these mountains are covered with terraces, and on the terraces they found broken pottery. And then when they looked at the Talmud, they realized that in the days of the judges, the people would gather there for their holy festivals three times a year, and they would eat in the presence of God. You got to imagine those mountains would be covered with hundreds of thousands of Jews surrounding the tabernacle of God, eating, feasting, and celebrating. And they found the broken pottery only in the places of the mountain where it faced the tabernacle, and that's because when the people would finish eating, they would smash the vessels because they were considered sacred. That's pretty cool. But it gives us a picture of God who chooses to camp with his people. And you can't understand Christmas without this because God became flesh and tabernacled with us. He lived in the midst of us. So now we go back to this four-letter word, L-O-R-D, Lord. Why is it L-O-R-D? Why is it capitalized in your Bible? It's because it's the unspeakable name of God. Amen. Now, in church life these days, a lot of people sing songs about YHWH. And right now, I'm just not going to use the word. We sang a song uh, called Jehovah. We're going to sing it again. But Jehovah is actually not the word YHWH, but it is a replacement for it. What is this word? It's the unspeakable name of God. There's over a thousand names for God in the Bible. But there's one name that's unspeakable, Y-H-W-H. That name was spoken only audibly in the temple by the priests when they worshiped. When the temple was destroyed in AD 70, Jews stopped speaking the word. In Israel today, God will be primarily referred to by the name Hashem, which means the name. So they say the name, or they refer to God as the name. Some will say Adonai, which means Lord. That may, need, may not mean much to you, but in Jewish society, this is a big deal. The name is everything. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain because the name is so powerful. The name has authority. Why does it have power? The name was first used with Abraham, but it's specifically used with Moses. And when Moses met YHWH, the response from heaven was, I am... The best way to express it is, I am. I am your healer. I am your peace. I am your provider. I am. See, our God is a verb who wants to connect with your life and make things happen. He is the God who acts, the God of history. He's not a God of theory who's up on the mountains and makes you climb and work really hard to get him. He is a God who lives with you in the valley, who makes a covenant and is your God and wants to bond his life with your life. He is a covenant-keeping, making God. He makes promises and he doesn't forget his promises. And so you're trusting his promises. Our whole life should be from faith to faith. What are you believing God for today? I got a number of things I'm believing for. Number one, I'm believing that I will be famous with my grandchildren. So what are my life goals? Another thing I'm believing for is that we're going to build a city of refuge here that people from this region will come to and be safe. Another thing I'm believing for 
is that we're going to have the best Christmas light season this year we've ever had. Amen. That we're going to light up this community with the hope of Jesus. I can't get you on a plane to Israel to make a difference, but boy, we could make a big difference right here in Bothell. You and I could light up this entire region in a way like we've never done before. Do you want to start Christmas lights with half of the building illuminated? No. Do, you, do you want only one tunnel working? So you could stay after the first service. I think Brian, Brian's here. He's going to move the tunnel from over there to over here. You could come on Wednesday at 6 p.m. or you could come on Saturday at 9 a.m. And you're, you're going to not only be able to help and work on things. You're going to build friendship and community. A lot of you don't have friends. You're finding it difficult to create relationships. Just come to lights and serve. And then when the lights turn on, you're going to look at strand number 36 on the building. And as you're sipping your co hot cocoa and munching in your cookies, you're going to be able to say to your friends and neighbors, I put up strand 36. Do you see that strip right there? That's my strand. He's a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And God remembers all of his promises so you and I can forget our fears. Isn't that good? There's nothing that you can remind God of that he has forgotten. He remembers all of his promises so you can forget your fears. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, who who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. I want you to meet some Jews who are trusting what I just read. The young men that are in this picture are part of the youth group at Bet Hillel Congregation in Ashdod. They are going to appear right now. There we go. And they are victims of anti-Semitism. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Why? Now, these young men have just lost their 19-year-old friend, David Ratner, who gave his life on the first day of the battle, shot in the neck, valiantly fought for another four or five hours, protected his regiment against a horrendous evil. Hamas is bad, not just for Jews, but for Arabs as well. Hamas is dark evil. It's part of a dark satanic plot. Get back to that in a moment. These young men are dealing with far more than anybody in this room is probably dealing with because their phones are filled with pictures of their friends or friends of friends whose bodies have been cut up in pieces. How many of your kids have that on their phones? And I was asked to speak to their youth group. Their youth pastor had just come back from the front. He'd seen a lot of difficult things. He said, I don't think I can talk tonight. Their worship was dispirited. Of course it was. They're grieving. And so we talked about grief, how we have to be emotionally honest with God to receive his comfort. <sighs> but I thought, how is it we're living in a world that we fought World War II? Didn't you think that after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism would come to an end, and yet now it's such a live topic in society today? Why? Yeah, well, you need to understand the deep plot the plot against the people of God. Uh, Psalm 2 is where to go. It says, why do the people rage and the nations plot in vain against the Lord and against his anointed? See, I've established my king on Mount Zion, the holy hill. And you think, well, what is that all about? It's about anti-Semitism, and it's about the dark demonic plot against the Jewish people. L let, let me explain. You're God, and you want to reach the whole world. How are you going to do it? There's so many different races and ethnicities and language and cultural backgrounds. Wouldn't it make sense that you would choose a people to work through? You would choose a people to become people of light, to become people who would serve the nations. They would become priests to the nations. Wouldn't that make sense? And if you choose one people, wouldn't it also make sense that everybody else would become jealous of God's choice? You have kids totally understand what I'm talking about. Any preference that's shown to one can create jealousy in the other. But God didn't make that choice to cause one race to be jealous about another. But rather, the Jewish people were called to be a kingdom of priests to serve, and through them to come Messiah, who would be given as the light, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And as a result of the Jewish Messiah, you and I are in this room today. 
If you are a follower of Jesus, you follow a Jew, and you have to deal with the question of anti-Semitism because if you don't deal with it, it will affect directly your relationship with Jesus. But once you deal with the question of anti-Semitism, you're going to be able to deal with all racial discord that's in the world today. That's the mystery of the church because this is the place where the division is healed. And it begins with this story. So what does God do with this battle? Well, it says, first of all, I've installed on Zion my king. This is Jesus, and one day Jesus will return the first coming, oh, sorry, the second coming for believers in Jesus today will be the first coming for many Jews, both religious and, ex and, and secular, who are going to come and believe in Messiah. And Jesus will return and reign from Jerusalem. And the hill is still a holy hill, and he will come through the eastern gate. That is the place that he has chosen. It's the place where God has chosen to dwell. And he's going to there bring the nations together. Hmm. And scripture goes on, and it says that the one enthroned in heaven laughs about those who oppose God's plan. Why? Because God is in such control, he's in such authority, that the last laugh is those who stand against his plan. Think through history. Anybody who has cursed the people of God, how has it gone for them? Talk to those who went through the horrors post the Holocaust or to those who watched the Spanish Empire dissolve after the Inquisition. Those who stand against the people of God pay a price because they're interfering with the purposes of God. On the other hand, those who bless Abraham will be blessed. Now, I was looking at the giving record of us as a people toward Israel, and I just felt the Holy Spirit say, you're going to have a really blessed November and December, not just the church, but all of you who participated in this. Because you have blessed Abraham, you will be blessed. God hates anti-Semitism, and he's looking for those who align with his purposes and speak. And we as believers should be at the forefront of that. I was so touched with my friend Salim. Salim is an Arab pastor. He lives in the city of Nazareth. He grew up in the neighborhood where Jesus grew up. He leads a beautiful congregation, and their church is committed as Arab believers to serve Jews, specifically the Orthodox Jews who live as an oppressed group in that Nazareth region. They've been doing this for years. Now, Salim grew up throwing rocks at Jews, being angry against the Jewish people until Jesus got a hold of his heart and gave him a vision of what the Scripture teaches, the one new man, Jews and Gentiles coming together in Yeshua, Jesus. We went out to dinner afterwards. His congregation, they're incredibly lively. They, the ladies do that, the whole thing, where they go, ooh, 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 at the back of the room, and they're really, really funny. But we had this fantastic meal. And he leaned over dinner, and he said to me, we Arabs are more afraid of Hamas than the Jews are. Because if Hamas come into Israel, they will first go for us, Arabs, because they will see us as being complicit in helping the Jews. And I thought, if an Arab can stand up for the people of God, then we can stand up for the people of God. Anti-Semitism used to be something that was remote in the history books. It was something about Nazi Germany, other eras of history, but now it's in every workplace conversation. It's in your neighborhood. Speak up for the people of God. Your Jewish friends are not doing well, and they need us to speak for them according to God's purposes, according to God's plans, plans that will bless not just the Jews, but bless the Arabs as well. Now here's the last thing, is that courage is found by opening the door in the dark to the light. Now, you may have a closet at home, and when you get up in the morning, your lights are on in your bedroom, you go to the closet to open the door. Do any of you think, my goodness, I gotta be careful? Because if I open that door, 
the inky black darkness of my closet is going to seep out and stain my carpet. It's going to saturate the bed covers. It's going to get into the drapes. The, the, the walls are going to get sooted with darkness because the dark is going to come into the room. No, you open up the door and the light invades the dark, doesn't it? Whenever you and I open the door of fear, we are letting the light of God come in. And part of that is dealing with anti-Semitism. So let's look at the opposite. How does God feel? What is his sentimental feeling toward the Jewish people? There's a powerful nest of scriptures in the book of Deuteronomy, verse 32. God says, the Lord's portion is his people. The only thing that God has kept for himself in the human race are the Jewish people. He says that he guards Jacob as the apple of his eye. Some of you have children and they have your deep affection. God feels more compassion for his people than we could possibly feel for even our own children. He says in Isaiah 49, 15, I will not forget you. See, I have you engraved on the palms of my hands. And today in Israel and around the world, many people have written names of the hostages on their hands as they're praying for them because God has those names engraved on his hands. So how do we love practically? <laughs> I was staying in Nazareth about halfway through the trip. I was really tired emotionally from what I've been going through. I felt like the Lord said, sleep in. I don't sleep in very well, but I had a great morning. I slept in. Then I felt like he said, pack your bags by about 10 o'clock, and then by about 11, go down to the lobby. The Holy Spirit will guide you in little things, and I did. I got down there, all the right timing. And I felt like he said, just work on your social media. So I sat there, my luggage was beside me, and I had a little bag I picked up before I left about a triathlon event I had done. Didn't think about it. This friendly Jewish man and his wife came walking into the lobby, and we began chatting. He started speaking. Name is Oren. He had an American accent. He said, yeah, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, but raised here in Israel. And we started talking about triathlon events. He told me the story of his sister, Tamar, back in 1996, was out on a cycling trip and training for an event and was struck by a hit-and-run motorist and died. And then her, his mother, Susie, began a national triathlon for women in Israel in her memory, and that had been going for 20 years until his mom died of cancer in 2017, but had her really valuable carbon fiber bike left behind. And Oren and his father made a decision that they would gift the bike to someone worthy. And they scoured Israel, and they chose one triathlete, a triathlete named Yamit, who had made a decision with her family to live at the border of Gaza together with many other Jews, committed to what is called coexistence, that they would live in love with their Arab neighbors. Until Hamas came, thankfully, her family escaped, but they took the bike. Now, in light of all the tragedy, this is a really small thing. But still, it was significant. They took the bike. Oren wrote a story, a simple little story about what he had experienced. He wanted to share it on a triathlon platform here in the U.S. He knew the editors. They replied back, the story is too political. We can't publish it. And something got my holy anger. <laughs> and I said, Oren, I'm going to do something about this. I didn't know, but I got to work on my social media. I wrote the best I could. I put the pictures together. I put it on all my platforms. And it actually took off on LinkedIn for some reason. And it got picked up by all these people. And it got reposted, reposted. And somebody in Israel picked it up, and they gave Yamit a bike. And then they all gathered together with the kibbutz. This is Oren with his dad. In that next picture, you're going to see them all at the beach. And this is the kibbutz just north of Tel Aviv, gathered together, and they're all holding posters. These are posters of the hostages that have been taken. And they're there standing against evil. But they know that there are believers in Bothell who love them and believe for them. Oh, one more thing. Oren's 
brother lives right here in Seattle and works for Expedia. How cool is that? You just have no idea what's going to happen when you open the door and let some light into the darkness. I mean, how about you stand up against fear and darkness? Anti-Semitism is definitely one of it, but there's so many other things we need to bring light into darkness. Now, we all can't get on a plane to go to Israel, and that's not my goal, but my goal is this, is do something you're afraid to do because you believe in God, in his word, in his promises. He will be faithful. Don't look to the mountains. He's not up on the top of hills. He's a God who lives with you in the midst of the valley. He is with you. He is Emmanuel. And this Christmas, let's show people that God is with them. And they're not going to discover that God is with him, them simply through the lights. It's the people behind the lights. They need to meet you. They need to get cookies out of your hand. They need to hear your, converse, your questions and conversation. How about we push back the darkness this Saturday morning, 9 a.m.? How about we have more people show up to volunteer than we've ever had before? How about you recruit some friends and neighbors to come and help? How about you show up on Wednesday night if you've got extra skills and electricity and that kind of stuff? Come out and help us with that. And then download the church app and begin signing up for the nights. You can book nights ahead. We need help with parking and baking cookies and serving. We're going to be a powerful community. And then we're going to come out of this season, not just with a, a heart to serve, but we're going to be better connected, more in love with each other as a body of believers than we've ever been before. We're going to hit January with new passion and fire in February and beyond because we're one body working together. At least, amen. And so gifts into our year-end giving for the new screen. This screen is going to give that gospel Christmas movie, and we're going to communicate the message of Jesus to our community in a way that people have never been able to experience before. Amen? Well, please stand. I want to pray for your life of faith. And Lord, I am joining right now in agreement of faith with every single person in this room and those who are listening online, that whatever they have believed for, it will happen for them as they have believed. When Hannah prayed in the tabernacle, the priest simply said that, her, that she would receive what she had asked of God because she prayed in her heart. And this is all the prayer that these people have right now. They're praying in their heart. And I pray, Father, according to their faith, that you would hear them and answer them. I pray that you would heal sicknesses and drive out demons. I pray that you would cleanse consciences and help people to walk in freedom from addictions, that you would bring financial provision and reconciliation in broken relationships. Do miracles here. The greatest miracle of all, bring people to know Jesus. We had a lady... In the first part of the service, we made a decision to get baptized to follow Jesus. Do you want to follow Jesus today? I'm going to lead you in a simple little prayer to follow Jesus. And this could be the day you get baptized. We're going to worship in a moment, but any time during the worship, you just have to walk out to the back, over to the right, where I'm pointing to your left, the door back there. There will always be somebody back there. And we'll help get things set up so you can be baptized today. If you want to follow Jesus, just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Dear Father, thank you for Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. And Jesus, I call you my Lord. Thank you for giving me new life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you put faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as seen through the eyes of Messiah. Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are not only a son of, or daughter of God, you are also a child of Abraham with all of the inheritances, all of the blessing, all of the promises. Welcome into the family of God. Could you welcome everybody who's made that decision to follow Jesus today? Amen.